aiming to free them from infirmity and pain. But tonight, the medical regulator is saying that anyone with an all-metal artificial hip joint should undergo tests every year for as long as they have the thing inside them. The ruling follows an investigation by this programme and the British Medical Journal, which has uncovered serious side effects in some people and raises profound questions about whether this sort of surgery is properly regulated. Deborah Cohen reports. Replacing a hip is about as physical as it gets for a surgeon. But as tough as the operation is, around 70,000 people a year have hip replacements. For most people, this is life-changing, taking away years of pain and disability. But for some, there can be a downside. Surgeons are concerned that some metal hips are wearing down faster than they should. There are fears that metal debris from the joint is poisoning patients. Around 2,000 patients a year are having to have their metal hips replaced. The UK regulator, the MHRA, today announced that 49,000 patients with all metal total hip replacements, like this one with a large diameter, will have to have annual checks because of safety fears. Particles of metal debris have destroyed tissue around the joints and thousands of patients and we understand on Thursday research will be presented looking at the risks of bladder cancer in these patients. No clinical trials were done before these hips were put in. One campaigning group is calling it a large uncontrolled experiment involving millions of patients around the world. Following on from the breast implant scandal, experts say the whole system for regulating devices is not protecting the public. Maureen Bales loved walking in the Yorkshire Dales near her home in Richmond. It was a surprise when the surgeon told her she needed to have two hip replacements. When I went to the hospital, I was told that I was going to get this new kind of hip joint, which was a state-of-the-art uh, joint. It was metal and it would last for almost my life, probably my lifetime. Maureen had two pinnacle hips put in. They're made by Depew, part of US giant Johnson & Johnson. They were fitted in 2005, but they've already failed. I have swellings in my lower abdomen, which um, had an ultrasound, and they said they're fluid, but, you know, obviously they shouldn't be there. Got it. Oh, they do concern me because, you know, lumps in my body, you don't want them. So you would never expect in a million years... Tony Nagel is Maureen's surgeon. He is about to replace one of her failed implants. There is really no other explanation apart from the implant is wearing out abnormally. I'm glad we've got here in time. Metal debris everywhere. Yeah. Front wall of the pelvis has, has just been eaten away. But it really is quite significant, the damage. Tony is scooping out a mixture of rotting flesh and cobalt and chromium metal debris from around Maureen's failed hip joint. Surgeons are worried about the levels of these metals in patients' blood because of possible long-term damage to health. We're seeing patients with 10, 20, 50 times normal levels. I think our highest level is nearly 300. Tony has removed the head of Maureen's hip implant and it's clearly damaged. That's where the, the, the wear starts and the wear goes right the way down to the floor. And that's the worn out part. And you can see that goes right the way around. This is mechanical wear and that's the problems you get with the mechanical. Maureen's hip has now been sent off to experts at Newcastle University. This is just one of several centres around the country who are trying to figure out what's going wrong. Let's see what they find. Maureen's hip joint is put onto a scanner which maps the damage. Mechanical engineers then analyse how much metal has worn away. We can see damage from the head. We can also see damage from the, the metal cup. So wherever we have metal surfaces in contact, then potentially that can generate uh, metal wear which will go inside the patient. Tom Joyce is an engineer who's analysed hundreds of failed hip joints. There are indications there that this group of metal on metal hips, these large head metal on metal hips, are failing at rates that we just wouldn't expect. So we're trying to get to the bottom of that and explain what's going wrong with things. Surgeons decided to use metal on metal hips because old versions made of plastic were wearing down inactive people. They thought metal would be a more durable option. 
some types of metal hips work well in young, active men. So how have these failing metal hips been allowed to get onto the market? The scandal of PIP's breast implants exposed the failure of regulators to protect patients and caused a public outcry. The same failure of regulation has led to thousands of patients needing their hips replaced. It's a long, costly process to get drugs onto the market. They have to be tested in test tubes, on animals and in large clinical trials in people before they're used by you and me. You'd think it would be the same for artificial hips and breast implants, but it's not. Doctors are concerned that there's not enough regulation to stop harmful devices from being put into patients. Carl Hennigan has studied the way medical devices are regulated in Europe. We realised with drugs like thalidomide we can't carry on with the current system. They're so catastrophic. And so the requirements for clinical data can be eight to ten years worth of development and drug trials. And not only that, you then have to have ongoing trials for safety and efficacy. With devices, it completely couldn't be any more different. And in fact, when I've looked at the system, my estimate is you could get a device through with a two to three day literature review and no clinical data requirements at the current time. So you're telling me that you could get a hip to market with just two to three days work looking at the literature? Yeah, and in America there's been in excess of 70 hips have gone through this system. There are only three that have got clinical data requirements. That's in the world. If you want to get a new drug onto the market in Europe, you have to go to a central regulator to get approval. But for a new artificial hip or breast implant, the manufacturers can choose who they want to approve it. They can go to any of dozens of companies who are all competing for their business. Depew use the British Standards Institution, which is better known for giving kite marks to such things as toasters and baby buggies. BSI wouldn't tell us what tests they had done on artificial hips because of client confidentiality. BSI said they were bound by strict obligations of confidentiality to our clients. Governments around the world have been very lax in checking these implants. An email we've seen from a senior product manager at Depew says it's a fun fact that in South Africa you could literally implant a tent rod if you wanted. It's astonishing that Depew could tweak the design without having to check how well it works in patients. The head became bigger and the top of the stem became shorter. The regulator, the MHRA, has known since 2006 that there were concerns about these hips. The data tells us about mid-90s people were seeing that there were metal ions increasing in the blood in relation to metal hip implants. But certainly by about 2006, 2007, there was enough data to really make this concern. As early as 2005, internal Depew documents show they were aware of the damage that could be done to patients by metal-on-metal -metal implants. They're now being sued by thousands of patients who have had to have their ASR hips replaced. They have put $3 billion aside to cover potential compensation costs. Tony Nagel is now an expert witness in the legal case against Depew, but originally he was paid by the company to train surgeons in the use of their implants. Now his hospital trust has recalled all patients with metal-on-metal -metal pinnacle hips. We've carefully monitored our patients. The trust has brought back all our patients uh, with pinnacle cups, nearly, nearly 1,000 tested them all, screened them, scanned them, and we know exactly what's happening. And we found out of about um, 970 patients, 75 failures related to metal debris, which is really quite high. Depew told Newsnight in the BMJ that patient safety is their top priority and that clinical data showed that the pinnacle was safe. Tony Nagel first told the company about damaged tissue in metal-on-metal -metal pinnacle patients in 2008. In 2010, a senior Depew executive said he was concerned about metal-on-metal -metal implants like the Pinnacle. He said, I feel the problem is emerging as more serious than the first thought, but the metal-on-metal -metal Pinnacle is still on sale. The UK regulator, the MHRA, appointed a committee to decide the fate of metal-on-metal -metal hips. It included several experts paid by the manufacturers. The committee concluded that there was no need to restrict the use of metal-on-metal -metal hips. They said that patients should be told about the risks, but no alert was issued to patients or surgeons. 
Today, the MHRA said that all patients with large diameter metal-on-metal -metal hips would receive annual checks because of the new evidence about them. Being an orthopedic surgeon, you like to hit things. Tony has fitted Maureen with a new hip made of ceramic and plastic. Yeah. Hello, Maureen. How are you doing, love? Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. The, the, the operation went really well. Good. And there was quite a lot of damage there, but we've got in just in time until it got beyond repair. Thank goodness it's out, that's all I've said. Absolutely, love. Mm. I'm so pleased it's out. So we'll have you... Maureen's operation cost the NHS around £12,000. If the problem is widespread, it's going to cost the cash strapped health service tens of millions. Well, our science editor, Susan Watts, is here. How worried should people be? Well, according to the regulator, the MHRA, there are some 49,000 people out there who have this larger diameter metal-on-metal -metal type of hip uh, implant. And uh, they've said today that these people should have annual checks because of these safety concerns over the device. They're saying people should go to their GP if they're worried find out what type and size of implant they've had to see whether they might require blood tests or perhaps an MRI scan to look for any possible problems to see if there's a sign perhaps of, of, of leakage of these small metal particles. There are parallels here, well there seem to be to a layman, parallels here with the, with the whole pip breast implant thing. Well I, I think common sense would tell us that in both cases the current system has failed patients. The MHRA's own website says that it, it is responsible for ensuring that medicines and medical devices work and are acceptably safe. And yet, in both instances, it's required reports of problems over many years and outside pressure for the regulator to act. And all of this is raising broader questions about how medical devices are regulated here in the UK and across Europe, specifically about whether there now needs to be safety testing before these devices are implanted and much better surveillance afterwards so that we're not relying on uh, reporting by patients and healthcare professionals, uh, but a much more rigorous setup. And then there's concern over this kite mark system. They notified bodies which have a contractual relationship with the device makers. They certify a device does what the man manufacturer says, but they, they don't release data routinely. They can claim client confidentiality over any data that they hold. Some argue also that they might have a vested interest in approving a product, hoping for follow-on uh, business from manufacturers for, for approval for further products. Now, all of this is increasing calls for perhaps a central European body to replace these 70 or 80 notified bodies, and that the system ought perhaps to look more like the system for approving drugs. Drugs are approved after many years of large-scale clinical trials. The system for medical devices, much less rigorous. And then concerns over the cost to the NHS of picking up the pieces if things do go wrong. Susan, thank you very much. Well, uh, with us now is Professor Sir Ken Woods, uh, Chief Exec. Clinical trials were conducted on, on this uh, hip joint before it was implanted in 49,000 people. Randomised trials were not required uh, in no. the so assessment of that, no. There were no clinical no. trials? The, 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 there are clinical studies required before a, uh, a joint is, is approved by the notified body or receives its, 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 its kite mark. But the nature of the clinical studies depends very much on the nature of the device. Do you want to apologise to all those people for whom the operation has gone wrong? I think the agency has acted with great thoroughness in recent years. We have uh, a situation in the UK where we are essentially concerned about the patterns of wear of these joints which have been very widely used. Now, there are 500,000 metal-on-metal joints at least which have been implanted worldwide. We were the first agency to put out a safety notice. Right, and uh, that safety notice, for example, the one that the advice that you gave today about people having an annual checkup. Mm -hmm. What was the new information on which that advice was based? The UK is fortunate in having the world's biggest national joint registry, which so contained over a million operations of knee and hip so replacements. When did you discover there was a problem? The problem has emerged over the last couple of years. Uh, when the first five you years were warned of experience... Of it six years ago, weren't you? No. Uh, if you look at the data from the National Joint Registry between 2003 and 2008, metal-on-metal -metal joints were no more likely to fail than alternative manufacture. It's only really been in the last couple of years that the, that the wear patterns and the failure rates have diverged as they have done. Is it not true that there were meetings held in 2006 at which these dangers were discussed. 
those meetings concerned the significance of the, of the metal ions that were released, uh, as you've heard. Um, the, the extent to which metal ions are released varies greatly from joint to joint. In some patients, the levels are high. In some patients, they're very low. Oh, indeed. Uh, and the patients in whom it's higher, the ones we're worried about. And that's precisely why we gave out advice two years ago now that patients with this type of device should have the metal ions measured in their blood. And if those iron levels are raised, then they have further investigations by imaging. So what has happened between that warning and today to make you say that they should have an annual checkup? No, we were advising an annual checkup of all patients with metal on hip replacements. What we have done now, with further information from the joint registry, and this has shown a much longer experience with these joints, is that we can actually focus the monitoring on those patients who most need it. That is to say, the patients who have the larger head so, metal on metal device. So, um, these joints were put into people without there being any clinical tests you already concede. Were you made aware of the fact that the design of the joint had changed? When I say there were no, you asked me if there were clinical trials. I yes. said there were clinical studies, yes. but not randomised controlled trials exactly. of the type that you might expect with a On human beings. Indeed. Note that the problem we're facing here is the question of the rate of wear, which can only be observed over many years of use in large groups of patients. And there were no such tests? It would be very difficult to devise randomised trials that would actually well, test this you can do it with point. drugs, can't you? The way in which drugs give rise to problems are fundamentally different from the way in which medical but devices The point is do. these people were being used as guinea pigs. I would dispute that phrase, guinea pig. The reality well, of is... Of course you don't like it. You cannot, you cannot test the wear patterns of human joint replacements in any animal species. No, you can test them on humans, which is what's happened. What we have done, and it is indeed an essential part of all medical device regulation, is to ensure that there is very good follow-up information and long-term analysis. It's the long-term outcome which has yeah. been the important point here. Were you told of the change in the design? The change of the design would be a matter for the notified body. Is that you? No, no, somebody else's we're the competent authority. We are the, the notified body is the organisation so which would assess the product. You didn't know CMR. that there had been a change of design? We're aware that there are changes of design, mm. but it is not to us to assess each change of design individually. Is it appropriate on the committee considering this, eight people, three of whom were on the payroll of manufacturers? The committee to which I'm referring, which actually developed the guidelines which we have been uh, developing today, um, was composed of representatives of the British Orthopaedic Association and the British Hip Society. They were not manufacturer representatives, they were experts in the field. And they worked with the data from the National Joint Registry, which again is held independently, to devise the best advice for patients now. When the Americans decided that uh, these joints should not be implanted in women of childbearing age, why didn't you do the same? The evidence on that is, is extremely equivocal. Did you think they were just being hysterical or something? The fact is that the uh, metal on metal joint replacements are the most widely used in the United States. They are very widely used. The data on the effects of these metal ions, firstly the extent to which they get into blood, and secondly the effects, if any, in women of childbearing age, do not allow one to make very Look, firm conclusions. You try to stop pregnant women from eating certain kinds of cheese. I suggest to you that having a foreign body implanted inside your own body with the possible catastrophic consequences that we know about would have been, on the precautionary principle, a sensible thing to do. What we are seeking to do by monitoring is to detect those patients who do generate a raised level of cobalt and chromium in the blood, and those are the patients who will go on to have further investigation with a view to removing the joint if it is necessary. We are intent on protecting patients from the effect of raised metal ions in blood. So this monitoring is with a view to the NHS then paying to have the things taken out of people, is it? The purpose of the monitoring is to make sure that in that minority of patients in whom there is accelerated wear, the detection of that wear early ensures that the joint can be replaced at a time when it is most satisfactorily done. What's the cost of removing one? 
I honestly haven't examined the cost. We're talking about we're many talking, thousands of pounds. We are, aren't we? It's but then, usually expensive. then hip joints wear out. It is a general phenomenon of all hip joints. And if you look at the different types of joint which have been developed, most of them have been driven by the attempt to reduce the rate at which they, they wear out. They don't all wear out while poisoning the patient, though, do they? The the point you're raising about poisoning the patient is exactly the reason we are setting in place this monitoring arrangement for patients with this particular type of hip. Thank you very much. Now this time tomorrow night we'll be hearing from the Health Secretary as we devote the whole...